There's a bridge in Rome you can cross. It's got three beautiful vaults, two minor ones, and you might take that bridge to cross the Tiber on your way to go visit the Basilica of St. Peter's. And you would. If you were Pope, you would actually walk in the reverse direction. You'd come out of the Vatican Palace, walk down the street, and hang a right, and cross that bridge to head your way down to St. John the Lateran to become Bishop of Rome and get the keys of Rome. That is called the Possesso, and the walk itself is a series of streets called the Via Papale, the Papal Route, for which this bridge was an important part, linking the Vatican City side to the Rome side. So in the 17th century, Gian Lorenzo Bernini gets the commission to redesign the bridge from the floor up. Now, when you walk to approach this bridge, on one side of it, on the way to St. Peter's, is the tremendous influence of the Castle Sant'Angelo. Now, this was Hadrian's tomb. It's huge, round, powerful, huge stones. They're unbelievable. Like, how do they pick them up? On top of which, the brick kind of grouping and a sort of block where the Vatican had papal apartments. The Pope would retreat there in times of trouble and distress and kind of close the door, wait for it to be over, like this. This is at the end of the bridge. It's quite powerful as an image and iconography. Bernini is commissioned to ornament the bridge with the images of Christ's torturing. That's the cross, the spear, the, the dice they rolled for his clothes are held by angels, eight of them, on either side, on the abutments of the bridge, the great piers, the sponsor of the arches, with another pair at either end that are stiff. So when you approach it up the street and you see it for the first time, those two stiff statues stand there and the curvaceous, undulating silhouettes of these sculptures, Bernini carves, it looks as if it's, it's a nightclub. And they're all dancing, and those are the bouncers at the door. It's tremendous, and as you engage the bridge and walk across it, now what Bernini did with sculpture was give the silhouette of a sculpture in any angle at which you would look at it, it was dynamic. This is just an amazing accomplishment he gave to sculpture. But as you walk across the bridge, an unusual set of things happens. The first is that with almost not knowing it, you're walking down the center of the bridge. Most of us are compelled to go look over the edge to feel the drama and look at the water. He relieves this necessity by raising the balustrades to the height of the eye level of a 17th century Italian. And the walls are opened with the first use of cast iron in architecture so you could see the water. So involuntarily, you walk down the middle of the bridge. The angels start doing their work. You're almost up to one. You're, in fact, about 45 degrees from the base of each statue, and something unique happens. Each angel on both sides does what we call a frontal oblique. That means the angel is doing something more as you approach this moment to bend to look at you with its face to show you the dice. It's the only moment that the crown of thorns is actually makes a perfect circle. It's frontal, tilted, right at your mug as you're on that center line. And you say, oh my God. Look at that. You walk further at 90 degrees. It does it again. How is this even possible? And there's even Latin for you to read. Turn one more time, go further. Posterior, in the reverse, it's doing it again. All sets do this across the bridge. Astonishing. And yet, as you walk across, you're aware that the angels are talking to each other over your heads with mimicked lines and angles, lacing like your sneakers invisibly making a membrane, a surface of communication surrounding you. <laughs> Halfway between both sets of angels, exactly, a more remarkable thing happens. The angels are placed on, not outside or inboard, of the balustrade and given a right height so that the Castel San Angelo is exactly sandwiched between them so that the size and width fits exactly between them, foreshortening, compressing the castellancio into your face so that you do, you go, oh my goodness, look at that. And then you look, that, then you look, look at, then you go, oh my goodness. <laughs> so that there are no perceptual interruptions across that bridge. It linkages all the way across. Now, 
Bernini was known in our time as a genius of modeling solid form. I just described at least three different disciplines, architecture, urban design, art, maybe a touch of engineering. Where's, pu where's, where's public policy? It's in there somewhere. Which would take a concerted effort in our time period to put all those together. He did it in the person of one person, Anna Bodega, a workshop of 400 people. Now, this is not something peculiar to the Baroque or the Renaissance this idea of being able to integrate these things together. Uh, Alvar Aalto, the great Finnish architect from the, in the 50s, was able to give identity to Finland through his architecture, but he did paintings and drawings simultaneous with his architecture, and it was hard to detect where he found the idea. Was it in the painting or the drawings, or was it in the architecture? They happened contemporaneously, and clearly some kind of powerful dialogue is going back and forth. How wonderful. In my own education, as a young architect, I chose to take a drawing class finally from an artist. <laughs> I had to leave the School of Architecture at the GSD and walk over to the art department and argue my way into a class where one tall, thin Romanian from Brooklyn, New York, named Flora Natapov, pulled the scales off our eyes and taught you to see a deep sense of order. And I don't mean organization. I don't even mean composition. It was a living feeling of order that you could find in the act of deeply seeing and, seeing and feeling. Now, she did this for all 14 of us in that class. And to this day, we are friends, and we are contracted to each other by this common experience we had in that class. I would walk back to the School of Architecture, the GSD, look at my colleagues' projects, and out of my sleeve would tumble remarkable solutions to help them with their project that I did not arrive by by the way I had been taught as a design architect. I thought, whoa, what is up with that? I knew this was Flora's work on us, to see order, deep order, living order. So why is it I had to go outside of my design education to argue myself into a class? Why was that necessary? Why was something found treated by most architecture design schools and a lot of other design schools as an ornament to your education was not central to it, when clearly it could. Well, part of the reason was that the American school system, educational system in the universities and colleges, it was largely influenced by the success of the French model, which is the L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the School of Fine Arts, in Paris, which was, in the 19th century, the powerhouse of its day. And the Enlightenment had given much to the Code of Beaux Arts such that the distinctions between things would be identified and how do we understand the difference between one thing and another and so forth, the virtue of the Enlightenment. So within the Code, the departments and school of architecture got yanked out of painting and sculpture conversation, got put over there. Their discourses became different, their critique, their understanding, their evaluations, et cetera, and so forth. Thus. Our professions, our disciplines were born, but so thickened around them, the silos that separated us. Now, there was a rebuttal to this around 1909 in Germany, something called the Bauhaus, a theory that said crafts through design, through fine art, linking us even to the fabricator, would all be held in common, that there would be no dominance of one over the other. They're as valuable and as necessary to cross-pollinate each other as possible. Well, a lot of our modern sensibilities, our modern aesthetic in design, comes from the influence of the Bauhaus, which lasted only 14 years before a guy named Hitler showed up, scattering them to the four winds, and some who came to the United States had to fit into the French-inspired, siloed schools of design and art, unable to produce a Bauhaus again. As I analyze the great architecture on our planet, I mean, the great stuff. What I kept finding were two things over and over. The first was that the, the, the person who invented that design never did one thing in life. They did many things. And a significant artistic inquiry was always one of them. The second thing I discovered is that when you go to analyze why is this act of design so remarkable, and you peel back the layers to understand how, why things are the way they are, you find that those other things they did were woven into the design itself. Why do we not teach this habit of mind? So I propose the student interested in this would take, do two studios at the same time, one in a serious design inquiry, 
And at the same time, they'd have to take one in a serious artistic inquiry and write no pedagogy to link them. Allow synthesis to be in the mind of the individual by proclivity, talent, intelligence, and serendipity. Design, particularly the one I know so well, which is architecture, has its feet rooted in the clay of utility. But I know to leave it there is not enough. As a designer, to keep the wind from blowing your stuff around and to keep the weather out is not sufficient. It is by what measure of artistic conscientiousness I had developed that I would know how, through the magic of artistic inquiry embedded in design, to raise utility up to the level of ceremony, even the ritualistic. Artistic inquiry, a tremendous habit of mind. It's a form of inquiry. It generates worlds of imagined possibility. As much describing not what we are, but what we could be. Humanity, you're not done yet. It's not as if you go to college, you learn about humans and fits a cup. You go, I'm ready to make art for that. Or I'm ready for design. I'm done. I got you. So humans, fundamentally, we are lacking in definition. We are ill-defined. We may be undefined. We're certainly not being finished being defined. This is what artistic inquiry does. It helps provide the very definitions by which our humanness is possible, could become, could be. And in fact, artists are the kind, one well, of the few kind, that will perpetually put themselves at the edge of the unknown because they can feel the presence of things that have not yet been born into the world. They owe a debt with the seen to the unseen. They can sense possibilities that are pregnant and on the tip of our understandings. The research you do as an artist is categorically not only linear and analytical. It's of a deep other kind. The artist is the advanced recon of the human spirit. I say to the child born to the impulse to creation, innovation, and discovery, see like an artist, think like a designer, and feel like a human.